Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery. This week we're covering the case of Misty Donna Copsey. She was born on the 3rd of October 1978 and if she were to be found alive today she'd be 40 years old. However she disappeared at just 14 years old on the 17th of September 1992 and she's never been seen again. Now Misty was the kind of girl that you could probably pick out from a crowd. She was 14 years old but already 5'8", five 5'9". Eight, five she was very very tall. She had blonde hair and green eyes. Misty was raised in a single parent family by her mother Diana Smith although she was still in contact with her father Buck Copsey. Misty and her mother lived together in Pialup, Washington. Now I'm very aware that I'm probably saying that wrong. It's spelt very strangely, I think it's pronounced like Pialup but most of the videos I've watched say Pialup. I don't think it translates very well with my accent. Pialup. I think that's how you say it. I'm so sorry if that's wrong. But Pialup was a fairly small town with a population of about 25,000, about 10 miles outside of Tacoma, Washington. Misty in general was quite a good girl, she was a good student, she had sort of a B average, you'd always get B's and A's at school, and she was very athletic, she played all kinds of different sports. She was a popular girl and got on with pretty much everything, she never had any problems making friends because she had that very sort of goofy personality, she could make fun of herself and she was just a fun person to be around. This would later prove to be a bit of a problem with her case because everyone wanted to be involved in Misty's disappearance, everyone wanted to be connected to her and to be her friend. Misty was pretty independent for her age, she was 14 years old but like I said she was quite tall so I can imagine a lot of people treated her like she was older than she was. Misty and Diana had a very typical mother-daughter relationship, they loved each other and they fought just as much. Just in the summer, about a month, maybe five weeks before Misty disappeared, they had a huge argument and Diana thinks Misty has run away so she goes to the police and files a missing person report only she gets home later that day and finds Misty just sitting in her bedroom and Diana's a bit embarrassed by this and so doesn't think to go back down to the police station and sort of tell them what's gone on and the police never followed up on it. But I think in general Misty and Diana had quite a good relationship. On the day of her disappearance she'd gone to the Piadup State Fair which is now famously known as the Washington State Fair. She'd gone with her best friend Trina. Not much ever really happened in Piadup, it was quite a quiet small town but the State Fair was like the one attraction a year that drew people in from all across the state. Now Diana wasn't actually keen on Misty going to the fair in the first place because Diana was working late and she knew that she wouldn't be able to give her a lift home later but Misty begged and begged and begged and eventually Diana thought fine I let you go but you've got to sort your own way home and you've got to tell me what you're doing but Misty was like that's fine I'll get the bus the last bus to Spanway which is where Misty lived it was sort of just outside of Pialup comes at 8 40 me and Trina will get on it together and although Diana was a little bit nervous about this she knew that Misty caught the bus all the time you see Diana was a caregiver for the elderly and so she worked shift work so sometimes she'd be at work until late in the night sometimes she'd be working all night sometimes she do the regular nine to five so Misty kind of had to be independent and figure out her way around and so she caught buses all the time she knew what she was doing she was a smart kid although Diana was complicit in a little white lie that she told to Trina's guardian Trina's guardian was like she can't go unless she's getting a lift home so Diana said yeah that's fine I'm giving the girls a lift knowing full well that she wouldn't be but not in her wildest dreams did she ever expect something like this to happen as you can probably guess, the girls end up missing the last bus and so Misty has to call her mum quite sheepishly and say, yeah, I missed the bus. And Diana is obviously quite angry about this. She's trusted Misty and she's just let her down a little bit. So Diana's like, you need to figure out a way home. You need to call somebody to give you a lift. I can't give you a lift. I'm looking after a 97 year old woman. I can't leave her. So you're going to have to figure it out yourself. And she tells her to look through her electronic organiser, which was sort of the latest fad at the time. Nobody had mobile phones, but quite a few people had these organisers in which they had everyone's phone numbers. So at this point, Misty's like, yeah, fine, I'll call Reuben. And she probably said it knowing that it would wind her mum up a little bit because her mum hated Reuben. Reuben Schmidt was 18 years old, so four years older than 14 year old Misty. And he had quite obviously shown an interest in her. And this made Diana very, very uncomfortable. What's an 18 year old doing showing interest in a girl who's four years younger than him and a 14 year old? Reuben was a school dropout and to be honest, he wasn't really Misty's type. Misty preferred pretty boys and jocks. She was into the whole like teen idol thing. 
but Reuben could drive and so she lapped up all the attention from him. She was 14, she thought it was cool that an 18 year old was showing her attention, even if she didn't reciprocate it. But Diana could see this boy for what he is, he was creepy and predatory and she hated him and she'd actually overheard a phone call one night between Misty and Reuben where Reuben was telling Misty how horny he got just by looking at her and Diana overhears it and immediately tells Misty to hang up the phone she was not happy so Diana says to Misty on the phone you need to find somebody else to give you a lift and then call me back as soon as you know what you're doing Diana waits and that call never comes. So Trina's with Misty while she's making the call to her mum and around that time Trina realises actually I can just walk home. She lived in Sumner, which is just a couple of miles from downtown Peel Up, where they were, and so she just decides to walk home. It's easy of her. So she walks away, leaving Misty stood at the bus stop. Diana waits all night for this call from Misty. She's at her care job, just waiting for the phone to ring. And it never comes, but at no point, I think, does she really assume the worst. Of course, the worst does go through her head, but she was just like, oh, she probably went home and she fell asleep, or she did end up getting a lift off Reuben and knew I wouldn't be happy, so she didn't tell me. At one point, Diana even calls the home phone and there's no answer, but she just sort of justifies it to herself by being like, yeah, she's probably asleep, that makes sense. Um, only Diana gets home the next morning and calls out Misty's name and there's no answer. She never came home. So at this point, Diana starts really, really freaking out. She starts doing whatever she can to try and get hold of Misty. So Diana's first instinct is to call around all of Misty's friends, see if any of them have heard from her or if she's with any of them. And so she starts with Trina, but of course Trina's at school, so doesn't actually answer. So she drives around to Trina's house and leaves a note on her door telling her to call her as soon as she gets in. And she then calls around the rest of all of Misty's friends that she can think of. She calls Misty's grandmother, her own mother, who hasn't heard from her. And then eventually she calls Reuben. And Reuben answers and he says that, yeah, Misty did call him asking for a lift, but he didn't have any petrol. And so he couldn't. Eventually, Diana obviously calls 911. This is later that morning. And the dispatcher is no help whatsoever. They tell Diana that they can't do anything until 30 days have passed. Until then, Misty's just a runaway. Diana knows this isn't true. She knows that Misty hasn't just run away in the middle of the night just because she couldn't catch the bus home, but she doesn't know what to do next. The police won't help her, nobody's heard from her daughter. Like, what can she do? About 1.30 p.m. that afternoon, she ends up driving to the Pierce County Sheriff's Department, which was the department in charge of the area where they lived in Spanaway. And the person who she speaks to there tells her that actually no, the dispatch is wrong. She can file a missing persons report now if she wants to. And so that's what she does. However, this case was a bit of a jurisdictional nightmare because Misty and Diana lived in Spanaway, which was under the Pierce County jurisdiction. But Misty had gone missing in Pialup, which was obviously the Pialup Police Department jurisdiction. So there was sort of this discord between the two departments. It was a dispatcher with the Pialup Police Department who had originally told Diana that she had to wait 30 days. Diana spends all day trying to retrace Misty's footsteps but doesn't get any further than before but eventually when she goes home she receives a call from Trina and Trina tells her pretty much what I've already said that she had walked home and left Misty at the bus stop. So Diana decides to call Reuben again only this time Reuben doesn't answer it's his roommate James Tinsley. Diana asks James if Reuben was home all night the night before and James says no him and his uncle went out to pick up Misty. So already we know that either Reuben or James is lying here. This is the beginning of a case with so many twists and turns. A while later, Diana calls back again and this time it speaks to Reuben and Reuben says that his roommate got it wrong. He did leave the house, but he just went to go to a party. He wasn't going to pick up Misty. So now we've got three different versions of the same story. But it is a bit strange that when Diana called him that morning, he mentioned nothing about a party. His story had completely changed within just a few hours. So Diana is at complete loss. She doesn't know where to turn next. The police aren't really doing anything. None of Misty's friends have seen her. There's nothing she can do herself. So she decides if it goes on much longer, she's going to turn to the media for help. Meanwhile, there's a woman called Tammy Horner working part-time at the Pierce County Sheriff's Office. And she has spoken to Diana. She was the one who spoke to Diana that morning when she was filing a missing persons report. And 
Tammy said that she just had a feeling about this case. She knew that it didn't seem like a regular runaway. So she talks to her superior. She speaks to her captain, who is Captain Gary Smith. And Gary actually kind of agrees with her and says, yeah, it doesn't seem quite right. I put a young deputy on the case. And this deputy is Brian Coburn. You'll probably want to remember that name. It does come up quite a few times. Coburn said he is limited to what he can do in this case, but he goes around to some of Misty's friends, ask if they've heard from her. They all say no, and that's kind of where he leaves it. So Diana takes matters into her own hand. She prints out a load of flyers about Misty and sticks them all up around Spanaway and Pialup. And she goes around and just tries to talk to people, see if anybody has seen anything. And she manages to track down the bus driver who was driving the route to Spanaway that night. That bus driver confirms that he actually did see Misty around 9.20pm that night in downtown Pialup. And he says that Misty asked him when the next bus is coming to Spanaway and he said like, it's not, there are no more buses. But he did offer her an alternative route. He said to catch the bus into Tacoma and then to catch a bus out of Tacoma to Spanaway. But apparently Misty didn't even bother listening to him. She just started to walk away before he'd even finished. Over the next few days, friends and family would stop around Diana's house to see if she'd heard anything from Misty. Of course, she never had. But this included Reuben. Reuben came round just trying to like stick his nose in and see if anybody had heard from Misty. Diana would reply that nobody had heard from her, the cops hadn't heard anything yet, and so Reuben would just walk away. After six days, so we're at the 23rd of September now, Diana decides like enough is enough, I'm going to go down to Pialup and I'm actually going to do a missing persons report. And so she does, she marches in, she's like, I'm filing this report, give me the paperwork, let me do it. Diana says she remembers pretty much everyone she spoke to at the Piala Police Department being pretty indifferent about Misty's disappearance. Nobody really took her seriously, they were like, yeah, she's probably run away, she'll be back, they always come back. And no matter how much Diana said, like, no, I know my daughter, she hasn't run away, they were like, yeah, she's run away. But a little bit of credit where credit's due, they do send out a couple of deputies to sort of just have a nose around. They send a couple of officers to the PR fairgrounds where they talk to some of the workers and they all say like, no, we didn't see anything. And then that's kind of it again. The person who kind of took charge of Misty's case at the PR Police Department is Sergeant Herm Carver. And he is pretty much useless throughout all of this. You're gonna be so angry when you hear his name throughout this, I swear. Um, but Captain Gary Smith from the Pierce County Sheriff's Department actually faxes Herm over some sort of documents and he puts a note on here saying like, I have a bad feeling about this, I don't think this is a standard runaway case, like look into it a little bit more and Herm Carver just doesn't really bother looking into it anymore. Carver does however decide to have a look into Diana's background, actually seems that he put more effort into looking into Diana than Misty at this point and what he finds about Diana's background he doesn't really like. You see, Diana loved Misty with everything she had. Her entire life since Misty's disappearance has been dedicated to finding her daughter. But Diana did have her own demon. She definitely, definitely had a problem with alcohol. And Diana would admit this herself. Alcoholism had been a massive problem for her throughout most of her adult life. And it would sometimes put a strain on her and Misty's relationship, but it didn't completely destroy their lives. She had a couple of DUIs on her record, as well as a previous conviction for welfare fraud. So a few years beforehand, Diana had moved her and Misty out of Peel Up and to Spanaway, which is just in general a nicer area. And whilst they were moving, Diana was working and also collecting food stamps. Diana said it was just a bit of an oversight on her part, like she knew what she was doing was wrong, but she was moving how she wanted to feed her daughter, and she just wanted to give her daughter the best life possible, but eventually Diana like knew it was wrong, and so goes down to the welfare office and admits what she's been doing. And because she was honest, they just tell her she needs to repay the money, and they give her a deferred sentence, so she never actually goes to jail for it. And Diana did manage to pay off all of the debt. She didn't owe them any more money at this point. It was just kind of an oversight. She wasn't a criminal. She just wanted to give her daughter the best that she could. Whilst looking into Diana's past, they also managed to dig up the missing persons report that she'd filed for Misty back in the summer in August. And this kind of solidified in their minds that Misty was a runaway because she'd done this before. In Sergeant Carver's eyes, Diana was a dishonest, alcoholic criminal and therefore they didn't need to bother looking into Misty. Almost two weeks into Misty's disappearance, Carver decides to go to Misty's high school and question some students there who knew her. And this is when Misty being quite popular comes into play because everyone wanted to be a part of Misty's story. And you've got to remember, these are 14 year olds. You might think they're grown up, but 
they're still children. One girl said Misty had actually called her the week before she was in Olympia and said that she was absolutely fine. Although she would later say that this girl never actually introduced herself or said like what her name is. So she just kind of assumed it was Misty. And the other girl said that she'd actually seen Misty at a concert the week beforehand. One of these girls, I don't know which one, I think it was the concert one, came forward years later and said that they just completely made it up. They just wanted to be involved in Misty's story. They really wanted to be her friend. They'd always like been envious of her being like one of the popular girls. Everyone wanted to be part of Misty's group. And so they'd made it up just to feel included. This girl was 14, she didn't realise the consequences of her actions and the consequences in this case were absolutely huge because Sergeant Carver leaves the high school and sort of says to Diana and Diana's with him at the time and says, Misty's run away, I'm taking her off the missing persons register. He just tells her the search is over, we're not going to look for your daughter anymore, she's just run away, that's it. Diana obviously was furious, she knew for a fact that Misty hadn't run away and the strange circumstances of Misty's disappearance surely should be enough to say to the police like, this isn't a runaway, she had intended to come home, if Trina hadn't walked home, if they hadn't missed the bus, her and Trina would have been on that bus home and they would have been back in Spanaway. So what would have happened between the missing the bus, Trina deciding to walk home, that made Misty decide like, you know what, I'm going to run away. The police don't interview Trina or Reuben or anyone else who possibly came into contact with her that night. They go into her school and speak to a couple of people who weren't really her friends and they look into Diana's background and decide that she's an alcoholic criminal and from that they decide that Misty must be a runaway. The next day is the 13th day that Misty's gone missing, so it's pretty much two weeks at this point. And Sergeant Carver actually goes on a Seattle radio station and says on the radio station for everyone to hear that Misty is just a runaway, she's not a missing person, and that nobody should be looking for her because Diana knows exactly where she is and Diana's just looking for attention. Because at this point the media have picked up on Misty's disappearance, so they're sort of covering it as a missing person. And the police don't like this because the police have decided that she's a runaway. So Carver's like, no, she is a runaway. Diana is lying. And everyone hears this. And almost immediately everyone starts to look at Diana in a negative light. Newspapers stop running their stories and shops take down their flyers. Everyone stops looking for Misty. Diana's trying to contact different newspapers, different like media outlets for their help and they literally are saying to her like, no, you're lying, we don't want to speak to you. I've covered a lot of cases on this channel which have been sort of destroyed due to incompetent police work and this is a big thing to say but I think this is the worst case for that. I think this is the most incompetent police work that I have ever, ever covered. It is just shocking. At this point, Diana is completely, completely lost. She doesn't know where to turn. The police won't listen to her. And this is where help comes from a very unusual source. Corey Boba is a name that you're going to be hearing a lot throughout the rest of this video. He was a Peel Up citizen and he was also a lone investigator. He had no connection to the police, no sort of investigative background, but he was obsessed. He was obsessed with finding the Green River Killer. He'd pinned it on his main suspect, a man called Randy Axiger, and he, him and Randy had basically been having a conversation one day, they were acquaintances, they just knew of each other, they weren't exactly friends. And Randy had told Corey a fact about the Green River killings that only the police knew, and from this Corey decided that Randy must be the killer. And when sort of confronted about this, Randy said like, no, I'd heard it from a police captain who I was speaking to in the sort of bar, we were both a bit drunk, he told me some things. But that was it, Corey's mind was made up. Randy was the Green River killer. Corey has spent the rest of his life, like literally up until today, trying to convince people that Randy is the serial killer. Like nothing could change his mind. He has harassed and like constantly followed Randy around. He's even broken into his house to try and find evidence on this. Now we all know that in 2001, it was proven that Randy was not the Green River Killer. It was a man called Gary Ridgway. I totally intend to do a video one day on the Green River Killer and all of his crimes. He was actually convicted of murdering 49 people, but he's actually suspected of killing up to 90 of them. So he is a pretty prolific serial killer. And to be honest, Gary actually being convicted of these crimes isn't too relevant to this story. I'll bring him up a little bit later on. Um, but the point is that Corey was obsessed with these killings and he thought it was Randy. And to this day, even though somebody else has been convicted, he still thinks it's Randy. 
Corey harasses the police for years and years and years trying to get them to look into Randy and so at one point they actually put Randy on their suspect list only they look into him and realise pretty quickly like this isn't the guy we're looking for and so they remove him. Police thought of Corey as a bit of a kook with a mental health problem and Corey would be the first to admit that yeah he does have OCD. Police were pretty sick of him, he was constantly calling, constantly giving them information, feeding them stuff that they didn't know whether it was true or not, and so the police had pretty much written him off as a madman. But Corey did have a theory, he thought he'd identified a pattern. So there were two other teenage girls who'd gone missing in the previous years in Pialup. This was 15 year old Kim Delange who was murdered in July of 1988 and 14 year old Anna Chibotnoy who was murdered in the August of 1990. These murders were exactly two years and one month sort of apart from each other and both their bodies were found in the same clearing in a woods off of Highway 410. Corey was convinced that this two years one month was a pattern even though there was only like two murders so one gap between them but he was like this is a pattern two years one month so he was convinced that in September of 1992 a third girl would go missing and he told the police this and of course who goes missing in September of 1992? Misty Copsey. Is this a huge coincidence or is Corey actually onto something? So Corey said that his mother was actually in downtown Pialup just running some errands when she spots a flyer about the disappearance of Misty and so she goes home and tells Corey what she's seen and he immediately gets Diana's details. He knows that he has to speak to Misty's mother and so he calls her. 26 year old Corey calls Diana and basically says to her like, I knew this was gonna happen, the police won't listen to me, your daughter is dead like literally just says to her like misty will be dead but i believe you i believe that she didn't run away i think something more sinister happened to her and corey is the only person who is willing to listen to diana who actually is on her side and so diana just kind of goes along with him on october 5th corey calls sergeant carver and basically says to carver like i told you this was gonna happen i know exactly what's happened to misty and carver obviously just dismisses him and is like leave me alone. He also tells Corey that Diana has a drinking problem, that she's a criminal and that there's a lot that went on in Diana and Misty's relationship that Diana wouldn't have told him and therefore this proves that Misty is a runaway. He states once again that Diana knows exactly where Misty is and that Misty is alive and well. And Carver tells Corey that the case isn't even within the Pialup jurisdiction anymore, it's actually been transferred back to Pierce County because of course like I said earlier it was only in Pialup because she went missing in Pialup but if she was just a runaway then it's a home county case and that's the Pierce County Sheriff's Department. He tells Corey that Brian Coburn, the first deputy to actually look into the case, is the one handling it and so Corey goes straight to Brian Coburn and does his whole spiel to him and Brian has obviously probably heard of Corey and again just fobs him off. Coburn pretty much repeats exactly what Carver said like Misty's a runaway, there's nothing we can do about it, she'll come home eventually. And then Coburn says something to Corey, which I think is possibly the most disgusting bit of police work I've ever read about. And he says to Corey that even if we do find Misty, even if we find out where she is, the last people we would ever tell would be you or her mother. They are just blatantly saying like, even if we do know where she is, we're not telling you and we're not telling Diana. Corey says to Coburn like, you will find Misty's body sooner or later, she has been murdered. And Coburn cold-heartedly replies, well, if she's found to be murdered, it's unfortunate that she met her fate as a runaway. There was nothing anyone could do to change a police's stance on this. Like, she was a runaway case in their eyes and that was it. And so Diana turns to alcohol the only way she knows to comfort herself and this just makes her look even worse than the eyes of the police. So Corey's harassing the police, basically telling them, like, if you don't actually get your ass into gear, I'm getting the media involved. He's threatening them. But the one thing you should never do is threaten the police, especially when you're a small time weed dealer as Corey was. The police want to get him off their back, so they set up a drug bust over the course of like four or five days. They watch him sort of sell weed about five times. On October 15th, they go to his house and they arrest him in front of his parents. And Corey didn't think it'd be that much of a big deal. It was a first time offense. It was only a little bit of weed, but the police really are fed up of him. And so they charge him with four counts of drug dealing and two counts of possession. He's looking at four years in jail, but obviously pending his court case, he's allowed out, he's allowed to carry on living his life. And so whilst he's out, he carries on looking for Misty. 
But once he's arrested, the police actually go to Diana and they say like, listen, you are attaching yourself to this guy who is just gonna lead you down a really, really dark path. Like we've been dealing with him for years. He is an absolute nut job. You need to get rid. And so they managed to convince Diana to actually get out a restraining order against him. She's stuck between a rock and a hard place. She's got the police who just will not listen to her. They won't look for her daughter. And then she's got Corey, who is obviously a little bit crazy. He's a little bit unhinged, but he's willing to listen to her and he's willing to help. She doesn't know what to do. And about two weeks after filing the restraining order, she decides like, you know what? I'd rather have this crazy guy who will actually listen to me and is doing something than the police who will not listen to me. So she actually gets rid of the restraining order. She apologizes to him and is like, I need your help. And this is actually around the 30 day mark, meaning that Misty is no longer legally classed as a runaway. She's officially a missing person. And so just as a formality, her name is placed back on the missing persons register, meaning legally she is now a missing person. But this doesn't change the police's opinion. Like this is just a formality putting her name on the register they still think she's a runaway. Around November that year, so almost two months after Misty went missing, they actually end up reopening the Green River Killer case. And this was, I don't think this was Pierce County or Pialup, this was Kings County. For Corey, this was a massive, massive victory. He thought that he was the one who'd finally been able to persuade them to reopen this, to look into it. But it wasn't really him, it was just they were just reopening the case because they had new leads. Um, and they added the two missing girls from Pialup, Anna and Kim, to the list of possible victims. Corey had mentioned this possibility of the two Pialup girls being linked to the Green River Killer about two weeks beforehand to Sergeant Carver, and Carver had laughed in his face, and Corey just felt like this was a massive fuck you to Carver because now somebody was listening to him. He felt completely vindicated. He thought now more than ever that he was completely right about everything. The so Corey corners an investigator from the medical examiner's office and basically asks him like, where did you find the bodies of the two girls? And this investigator says, Highway 410 near mile marker 30. As so Corey decides this must be where Misty is as well. He decides to organize searches in the area, getting together a really big group of people, including Diana, as so they go off, searching for any clue, anything that belonged to Misty. And of course, they don't find anything. But he'd made a huge song and dance about it. He'd even gone to the media and said like, this is where we're looking, we're gonna find something. The media turn up and there's nothing there. On December 2nd, Misty's case finally gets the upgrade it deserved. She is officially classed as a missing person under suspicious circumstances. This is a huge win for Diana. The sheriff's office finally said that they believed there was a possibility of foul play. And to be honest, I'm not 100% sure what caused them to do a complete 180 on their opinion. They said that they had decided that Misty was a good student. She had no previous history of having any problems like this. And therefore something more suspicious must have happened to her. But I can imagine for Diana, this was extremely frustrating because this is what she'd been telling them since the beginning. And of course now the case is once again officially a missing persons case is transferred back to where she went missing to Pialup PD. I'm really aware of the fact that I keep saying like Pialup or Pialup, I keep pronouncing it really differently. I'm re it's a really hard word for me to say. Um, so at some point in December, Diana is actually at the supermarket and runs into Ruben, and Ruben sees her and just bolts like he gets out of there and he actually gets into a van and he's speaking to the guy in the van, like pointing at Diana. And apparently, the guy who's driving the van, like his eyes just widen and they drive off sharpish, like they get out of there. Diana's mental health is deteriorating rapidly at this point. She's drinking more and more. And at one point, I think she actually tries to kill herself. I read that she woke up in hospital one morning, but was soon discharged. So on the 10th of January, 1993, a girl is actually abducted from Pialup. This girl is walking about five blocks south from where Misty was last seen. So literally like a five minute walk away. And she's walking down the road and this guy is calling out of his car window, $20 for above the waist or $40 for above the waist and I won't touch anything else. And this girl's just ignoring him. Like as a girl, you know that when a guy is catcalling you, you don't respond. You just carry on walking and try to get to safety. 
and she is just getting really freaked out this guy will not leave her alone so she actually starts to run and this guy chases her and drags her into his car he drives south for a little bit before stopping and raping her at the side of the road and then he takes her to a cliff which overlooks a ravine and he just drops her into the ravine he doesn't stop to make sure that she's actually dead he just gets in his car and he escapes and this girl didn't die she managed to survive it was about a 20 foot drop so it wasn't even that higher drop um so she managed to crawl out of the ravine and she runs to a nearby house that has lights on and tells them what's happened five days later the police arrest a 28 year old man called robert hickey his car is exactly as this girl described she even said that she dropped a gum wrapper in the front of the car and they find this gum wrapper still there um, and he's actually convicted of first degree rape and he is sentenced to seven years in prison Shockingly, this guy was never actually questioned in connection with Misty's disappearance, even though the circumstances sound very, very similar. I think this guy is a very good suspect. Towards the end of January, Diana goes on TV. She goes on a show called Northwest Afternoon and she's talking about Misty's case and she's actually there with Trina. And she's appearing on the show with a guy called Jim Doyen, who's a homicide detective in nearby King County. Like I said earlier, this is the county that's mostly dealing with the Green River killing case. This guy has spent years on this particular case of Green River killings and he is intrigued by Misty's case and he actually listens to Diana and is like, yeah, this doesn't sound right, something's up here. The next week he goes to Highway 410 himself and he spends six hours searching by foot for anything that could sort of connect it to Misty's case. He finds nothing but it's a godsend to Diana that an actual homicide detective is taking an interest in her daughter's case. And it's shortly after this that Corey realises that he's made a big mistake. He thought his informant said that the girls were found on the north side of the highway but they weren't. The girls were found on the south side. He'd been searching in the completely wrong area. So he organises another search, again drums up all the attention with the media, gets everyone talking about it, and he sets off with his search party. The fact that he's even telling the media is a little bit dodgy within itself because he's essentially telling the killer like if you've left anything in this area, now's your chance, you've got time to go and move it and sort of get rid. Um, but he did it on purpose because he thought it was going to provoke the killer and that the killer would purposely leave a clue. Um, like I said, he wasn't quite all there. So on February 7th, the entire search team arrives at Highway 410, this time to search the south side. And they're not searching for long before they actually find something. In a mound of dirt, they find a pair of blue jeans, they find a navy blue sock, and some girls underwear. Diana sees the jeans, a pair of baggy stonewashed jeans with their cuffs turned up and she immediately just loses it. She knew for a fact that they were the jeans that Misty was wearing that night because they were her own jeans. She'd lent them to her daughter for her fun night at the fair. See, Misty was tall. Misty was like 5'8", five 5'9". Eight, five Diana was even taller. And so these jeans were actually a little bit oversized on Misty, so they'd had to roll up the cuffs so they fitted her properly. Diana also later confirmed that the navy socks and the underwear both also belonged to Misty. She didn't know, obviously, what exact underwear she was wearing that day, but they definitely belonged to her. And for Diana, this was just confirmation of her worst fear. Of course, we all know since the very day that Misty went missing, Diana knew there was some kind of foul play involved, but still to actually see it, to see proof, to see your daughter's clothes crumpled up at the side of the road, must absolutely destroy you. And people said that it was like all of the fight just left Diana. She made a noise that wasn't even human. But this discovery planted a small seed in Diana's mind and everyone else's. It seemed almost too perfect that these clothes had been found there. And the detective, um, Jim Doyen, who had been there just the week before searching, hadn't seen them himself. And everyone started to think the same thing. Did Corey plant it there? And like I said, even Diana thought this. She went to the police and actually wrote a statement about her concerns about Corey. Some police even started to think that Diana was in on this and Diana had also orchestrated it and that the two were working together to prove a point to the police. Of course, Diana and Corey wanted to prove that Misty had been hurt, but 
I don't think any mother would do it and anybody who saw Diana when they discovered the clothes would say that she did not expect to find it. Detectives soon arrived at the scene and as this was King County jurisdiction, one of those detectives was Jim Doyen. Like I said the week before he was there and he was searching this exact area and he hadn't found anything but even he admitted himself like it was just him out there on his own searching by foot, just like having a quick scour of the area with his eyes. It's very possible that he just may have missed something and they actually did forensics on the dirt that the clothes were found in and they found that it was actually very very unlikely that the clothes had been planted there like only a couple of days beforehand or a week beforehand it was very likely that the clothes had been there for months at this point. Anna and Kim were actually found about a 10 minute walk into a woods in a clearing of course they weren't found at the same time I don't think I think they were found a little bit apart but both the bodies were like in the same general area which is what makes people think they were murdered by the same person. Misty's clothes were actually found just off the side of the highway so the clothes weren't in the woods it was literally like just off the side maybe somebody had thrown them out of the car window or somebody just like literally pulled up on the side of the road and really quickly like hidden them. They weren't like right into the woods like the bodies were but still this is a massive coincidence they were still found on highway 410 near mile mark 30. These clothes could have been put anywhere in Pialup or any of the surrounding counties but no they were placed here. At the end of February Corey had his drug trial and he actually pleaded guilty. He thought that because he'd been helping the police out so much they'd be lenient on him and of course they weren't. He ended up being sentenced to 14 months in jail. Finally the police had Corey off their backs but in a bit of a twist the police actually didn't even know where to go next without Corey's help. They didn't know how to even start looking for Misty. So they go into the jail and they ask Corey for his help. They say like, can you give us your case files on this? We sort of need it to try and help find Misty. And Corey says no. He basically tells them to fuck off. And you would think that Corey would happily hand over these files because he wants at the end of the day to just find Misty and help find the Green River Killer. But this wasn't the case. Corey wanted to find them himself. He wanted to be the one to get all the glory. He wanted the praise. He didn't want the police to be the ones to do it. Meanwhile, King County Detective Jim Doyen, I really hope you're keeping up with all of the different names here. I know it's a little bit confusing. Is actually pursuing new leads in Misty's case. He actually decides to interview people. It's almost six months after the disappearance and they finally talk to Trina. I think they actually interview her twice um, but I'm going to sort of like combine both the interviews into one here just to make it a little bit more condensed. Um, so they bring along a photo of the jeans they found and Trina 100% confirms like yep yeah, those are Misty's jeans. She also confirmed that the navy socks were Misty's as well and she knew that because just before they left to go to the fair that night Misty changed into a navy sweatshirt to match her socks. He questions Trina about Misty's personal life and Trina pretty much confirms what Diana's been saying since the beginning. I mean, she was 14 years old. She didn't drink, she didn't do drugs, she didn't smoke. She was pretty like straight edged. She was definitely a virgin. She wasn't really that interested in boys. She'd only recently started showing interest, but she liked the pretty boys, jocks, that kind of style. However, Jim also found out something new that night. He found out that Misty and Trina never ever planned to get the bus home. They were planning the entire time for Reuben to give them a lift. So around 8 p.m. they actually call Reuben and ask him for the lift and he says no. They actually gave him around five calls that night. Some of them he didn't answer, some of them the connection was funny. But when they actually finally spoke to him, this is when he said he had no gas money and so couldn't. Misty even told him that they would give him money. She even said to him like, if you go into my house, I'll show you where the key is. I've got money on the side, just get the money, then come and get us. And Ruben was still like, no, I'm not coming to get you. And so obviously by the time they'd figured that out, they'd missed the last bus anyway, so they were literally stuck. Trina actually says that she doesn't trust Ruben, but she didn't think that he would actually hurt Misty. She said that the reason she doesn't trust him anymore is because if he just come as they planned and given them a lift, then Misty wouldn't have disappeared. She says that she is so angry at Ruben because he's the reason that Misty went missing. Not because he hurt her, but because he didn't come and give them a lift that night. She said nothing strange or suspicious happened at the fair. There were no creepy men leeching on them. Misty didn't speak to anyone she didn't really know. There was just nothing strange. They walk into downtown, which is where Misty calls her mother. She actually called her mother from a payphone just outside of the police department, which is just, I find that very, very sort of foreboding, I suppose. Um, and this is where they actually find out that Trina has been lying the whole time. 
she didn't walk home on her own. She actually called her 23 year old boyfriend, a man called Mike Reiner, to come and give her a lift. Now there's actually a little bit of question as to whether Mike was her boyfriend or just a friend. Regardless, it's a 14 year old girl and a 23 year old guy. It's a bit creepy either way. I mean, very creepy if he's her boyfriend. Just still quite a lot creepy if it's just a friend. She said that she didn't tell detectives at first that this is what she did because she was scared of being judged because she left Misty, she got a lift. But Misty actually refused to get a lift with Mike. Like Trina said Mike would have given her a lift but Misty didn't want it. She said that Mike made her really, really uncomfortable. You see, Mike also had a very sketchy past. Like I said, he was 23 years old, so eight years Trina's senior. And seven years beforehand, I think when he was about 16, he'd been arrested for juvenile rape. He'd attempted to abduct a girl at knife point and tried to rape her, but he didn't end up getting charged for it. And the records are actually sealed, so you can't really see them. The police couldn't even see them at the time, so they couldn't get any details. Um, Mike actually said that the allegations weren't true. Somebody had made them up. Um, but I mean, to be accused of something like that, that's a lot of thought that goes into a lie. Um, and also alongside this, he had personal ties to both of the other girls that were missing, Kim and Anna. So he's also a very good suspect in this case. Um, so he actually came and picked Trina up and dropped her home that night. Trina said that he didn't stay around hers. It literally, they were in the car for like five, 10 minutes and then he left. So it's very much possible that he knew that Misty was in Piala on her own. And so he decides to turn around and go and get her. In the April, Mike actually sells his car, which again is crazy suspicious. Um, he had a blue 1981 Ford Escort. And little did he know that he was actually selling it to an undercover police officer because whilst actually publicly the police were still saying that Misty was a runaway, privately they were focusing on Mike Reiner at this point. He was like the number one suspect. So they actually buy his car, him not knowing that he's selling to the police and they do forensic tests on it. But these tests have never actually been released, so I can only assume that nothing came from them anyway. And so that is like almost where the story ends. Around July, they actually brought him in for questioning, where they spoke to him about Misty and Trina, and his connection with the other girls, and the rape incident. And he like openly talks about the rape incident. He says that he received a legal letter saying that all the charges were being dropped. It never happened anyway, and that was kind of it. Um, and after the questioning, they had to admit that they just didn't really have much on him, like... They had nothing. We've got to bear in mind at this point it was July and it was almost a whole year since Misty had gone missing. So small facts, small details would get lost and so it'd be easier for people to lie. So at this point, Piala are actually still investigating it as a runaway case. It's Kings County who are looking into it as a more serious missing persons case. Um, and Carver actually completely dismisses the idea that Misty could have been the victim of a serial killer. He says, there isn't anything that would make someone think that we've got a serial murderer out there preying on young girls. And he says this, knowing about the two bodies of the other girls that have been found, I'd say that's a pretty good indication that there may be a serial killer about. So the police actually finally decide to speak to Ruben and weirdly enough, it was actually the PR lit police that decided to do this. Um, and they don't speak to him because they sort of took it on their own back. They speak to him because Ruben's boss actually got in contact with them and said like, he's saying some very, very strange things. He is suspicious. So this is actually back in February. So we are like hopping back in the timeline a, bit, a little bit. Um, so Ruben's boss was a man called Frank Rodriguez and Ruben worked at Adam's Ribs, which is just a barbecue restaurant. Um, and Frank said that he felt that Ruben knew something because he kept making some really odd comments about how he knows where Misty is. Apparently he spoke about Misty constantly and he said, I know exactly where she is buried. They found the clothes, but she is buried six miles from there. They'd also make comments saying that they're like six miles, six and a half miles off. Um, so the cops would go and actually wait at Adam's ribs for Ruben to turn up for a shift one day. And as soon as he sees the police car, again, he just bolts like he did with Diana a couple of months beforehand. He just gets out of there. Eventually, the police manage to corner him. I think they go to his apartment and they talk to him. And he says that Misty did call him twice the night of her disappearance. But both times he said that he had no petrol and so he couldn't give her a ride. And apparently she got really, really mad about this. When they asked him about all of his previous comments that he'd made to Frank, he said that he'd said them just to get Frank off his back, which I find really weird because if you're trying to get somebody off your back about like 
a missing person that you just say I have no idea what happened to them you don't say yeah I know where she's buried it also comes out around this point that Reuben suffers from blackouts and he'd suffered blackouts since he was like a young child and he claimed that he'd had a blackout the night that Misty went missing and he said that he can't remember any of it he says he remembers coming around the next morning and so he drives to his grandmother's house now his grandmother wasn't home and she lived in a hundred acre sort of plot of land she lived on a farm and it was about 60 miles away, like it would be a 60 miles round trip. Well, how come Reuben had enough petrol to do the 60 miles round trip to his grandmother's house when his grandmother wasn't home, but didn't have enough petrol to do the 16 mile trip into Pialup to get Misty? His grandmother's farm was in Buckley, which is about eight miles away from where her jeans were found. They asked him outright if he could have blacked out and gone to pick up Misty and harmed her. And he said that he didn't know. He had no memory whatsoever of that night. Bear in mind also that he told Diana that he'd gone to a party that night, which is very strange. Um, the common thought here, obviously, is that he drove to his grandmother's house and buried Misty in the grounds, but there's a hundred acres of them. So that'd be a lot to search. Of course, they never checked Reuben's car or his grandmother's farm ever. Um, so on the 8th of March, Reuben actually takes a polygraph test, but it was very, very weird. The results came back as inconclusive, even though he later told Diana that he passed, which was a lie. But whilst they were asking him the questions, he was actually trying to make himself fall asleep, which is a very well-known trick to confuse polygraph tests. So of course the results did come back as inconclusive. If he had nothing to hide, why would he do this? Just like Mike, Reuben also sold his car very shortly after his police interview. And he didn't just sell his car to any regular person. He sells it to a wrecking yard. So his car was completely destroyed. And of course, the police never were able to get it to look into it. Police also decide to question James Tinsley, Reuben's roommate, the one who spoke to Diana and told her that Reuben had gone out with his uncle to get Misty. Um, and he said that Reuben had a very, very short temper and he actually wouldn't put it past him to harm someone in this way. He said that he remembered Misty calling that night and he specifically remembered because Reuben actually had his 13 year old girlfriend round there and apparently this 13 year old got very funny when Misty called and got jealous and stormed out. Um, this guy is dodgy as hell, so creepy. Um, but he said that Reuben actually left about five to 10 minutes after Misty called. And apparently he returned home a few hours later at around midnight. Um, as the year mark of Misty's disappearance sort of rolled around, Reuben was actually the number one suspect in the case. But the case was really, really slow. Reuben was brought in for a second polygraph test and this time he actually did pass it. And so they just drop him off the suspect list. They are literally back to square one. They've got nothing. This is even though he had no alibi, nobody could account for about four or five hours of his evening on the night that Misty disappeared. Apparently he suffered with a blackout. He couldn't go get her because he had no petrol, but he managed to drive to his grandmother's house the next morning. But this was enough for the police. He passed a polygraph test and therefore he couldn't have done it. Around this point, they bring Diana in herself as a suspect, which must have absolutely killed her, but she just wanted to help find her daughter. So if that meant that she had to go in and answer a few questions, she would do so. Um, and this was also despite the fact that she had a very strong alibi. She was working the night that Misty disappeared and she was with her client until like the early hours of the morning. So she couldn't have done it. They even interview her former parole officer, they interview her ex-boyfriends, and then eventually they get her to do a polygraph test and she passes it. Misty's case actually went very, very quiet for a few years, but towards the late 90s, the forensic tests that were done on her underwear sort of came out. Um, apparently they found hairs on there, which they tested years later again, and these hairs didn't belong to Misty or Diana or like anyone she knew. So there's a good chance the hair could have belonged to the killer, or it could just be hair from the fact they were lying there for so long. Like a lot of people would have been passing in their cars. So it literally could be anyone's. They found fibers and they also found three red paint chips on her underwear as well. So Corey, who's back in the picture by this point, obviously out of jail, is fighting tooth and nail to match these small red paint chips to the red Porsche that Randy drove. And he actually convinces police to test these, but it comes back as inconclusive. You're probably feeling a little bit sorry for Randy at this point. I mean, he's had Corey harassing him for years and years on end. But honestly, I wouldn't feel too sorry for him if I were you. In the summer of 1993, he's actually arrested for molesting two seven-year-old girls. So if you ask me, he deserved all the harassment he got. Interestingly, Robert Hickey, the guy who abducted the 15-year-old girl in January, 
also drove a red car but I don't think they ever did any tests I mean they never really even looked into Robert Hickey as a suspect so they'd never tested his car against the paint chips found on the underwear of course though her underwear was found on the side of a highway where thousands of cars were passing every month and so the paint chips could again literally be from any of them and this is pretty much where our case ends there's been no huge lead or any big leaps forward in the investigation in 2000, Diana actually got Misty declared as legally dead and held a funeral for her. So in Diana's mind, Misty has moved on. So let's round up and take one final look at all of our suspects. Um, so we'll start with Mike Reiner, who was Trina's 23 year old boyfriend, friend, whatever you want to think. Police didn't look into him though, so we don't have like a huge amount of information on him. He definitely had a shady past, but the charges were dropped in the rape case. Whether that's because he didn't do it or for other reasons, we'll never really know because the files are sealed. Um, he knew that Misty was alone that night. He dropped Trina home and doesn't really have an alibi for after that. So he easily could have turned around and gone to pick Misty up. Um, he didn't have a red car, he had a blue car, so if the paint chips are from whoever hurt her, then this isn't Mike. Um, personally, I don't see him as a huge suspect. The police seem to trust Mike when they interviewed him, although given the level of policing in this case, I would take that with a pinch of salt. Um, I could be completely wrong, of course, but I think there are better suspects in this case that we can look at. Um, he's definitely dodgy, don't get me wrong. I just don't see him being the one who took Misty when you compare him to the other suspects we're going to look at. Robert Hickey, so the fact that he abducted a girl in pretty much identical circumstances to Misty is very telling. Although the one thing I question in this case is that he didn't take much care in trying to hide the body of the girl he abducted. I mean, he just threw her off the ravine and assumed that she'd be dead. So I just find it a little bit hard to believe that he would have taken so much care in hiding Misty's body that it's never been found. Not impossible, of course, but that fact doesn't quite match up. By 2001, he's been let out of prison for a few years, and so he strikes again. He attacks a girl, again, in pretty much identical circumstances. He asks this girl for a cigarette, she says no and she's like immediately creeped out by him. She just had a feeling. So she runs across the road and he grabs her and he actually pushes her off a 15 foot embankment off the side of the road. Um, but what he doesn't realize is that while she's running away, she's already dialing 911 with her phone in her hand. And as soon as he sees her, she's sort of dialing 911, he gets out of there quick. Um, so again, he pushes her off an embankment, which seems to be a recurring theme in his abductions, his rapes. Um, so maybe they should be looking for Misty down the side of embankments or ravines or just off cliffs. Ruben Schmidt, the most obvious suspect here and I think the most suspicious. I mean, look at it. He has suffered with a very convenient blackout. So there's literally four or five hours which are completely unaccounted for that night. His roommate said that he was not home. He took an unexplained trip to his grandmother's farm when he couldn't even afford petrol apparently to get into downtown Pialup. Um, he bragged about knowing where Misty's body is buried, which, why would you do that? And that is pretty much everything. Like, that, for me, is so suspicious. How will the police have let him off when he's got no alibi? I will never, ever understand. Why did he try and trick the polygraph by falling asleep? I mean, he'd clearly done his research into how he can confuse a polygraph and make it inconclusive. I don't think the police ever questioned his uncle who was brought into the story a few times, or his grandmother, or his apparent 13-year-old girlfriend who was with him that night. I just don't know why they were never questioned, why they were never looked into. They could have given the police a lot more answers than they have. In the year 2000, he's arrested for theft, and in 2006, his wife actually takes out a domestic protection order against him because he threatened to kill her and burn down their house. This is his violent streak very much coming through. Out of all of the suspects, I personally think that Ruben is the most likely suspect here. If he's not the murderer, then he definitely, definitely knows more than he's letting on. He has been very shady with the police. I think if the police started investigating when Misty first went missing, then they very easily probably could have found something that tied him to this crime. But because they waited almost six months before even questioning him and didn't look at him as a serious suspect for almost a year, they probably missed out on a lot of very obvious things. And of course, as time goes on, people forget things, people start to lie, details get mixed up, and you lose your case. Let's talk about Corey Boba. A lot of people think Corey did it. People think he got so obsessed with his case that he just knew there had to be a girl who went missing two years and one month later. And so he did it himself. Um, although Corey has a very good alibi, he was actually getting beaten up by a neighbour at the time that Misty disappeared and he filed a police report at around 1.30am that night. 
Um, so unless he worked very, very quickly, it's highly unlikely that he could have done it himself. People say that he must have been the one to do it because he's the only one who found the clothes. But to be honest, when you're the only person looking, you're gonna be the only person to find something. I'm pretty sure if the police started looking months beforehand, maybe they would have found it instead. If you search Corey's name online, his Facebook page comes up and he is clearly like not mentally well. He types all in caps, doesn't really use any punctuation or correct grammar. He is still obsessed with the Green River Killer. He still thinks Randy did it, even though somebody else has been convicted for the murders. Um, it's just insane ramblings, but I don't think he hurt Misty. And this leads us on to our last suspect, the Green River Killer himself. Now he was never connected to any of the PR Love Girls murders, not Anna's, Kim's, or obviously Misty's. If it's not Reuben who harmed Misty, I'd place my bets as it being whoever harmed these other two girls, but we don't really know who harmed these other girls. Maybe it was the Green River Killer, or maybe it was somebody completely separate. Her clothes being found so close to where the bodies were found is very telling, but maybe somebody placed the clothes out on purpose because they knew of the possible connection there. Um, the only way that we'll know if Fridgeway actually did it is through a deathbed confession one day, which I highly doubt we're ever going to get. Um, however, it is important to note that Ridgeway was actually working the day that Misty disappeared. His like, work records show that he was there all day, so it's highly unlikely that he could have got there and harmed Misty. And then the last theory is that maybe Misty did run away, although I don't think this is likely at all because it's not like she had an argument with Diana and then packed a bag and ran away. She was at the fair with her best friend. They had plans to go back to Misty's house. I think they were going back together. And if Reuben hadn't messed them around, if they hadn't missed the last bus, they would have been on their way home together. And that's what I think the plan was anywhere. I don't think Trina was planning on going back to her own home. So it just doesn't make sense she'd ran away. So unless she was so annoyed at her mum on the phone that her mum like berated her for missing the last bus, she decides to like just get out of there. I find it unlikely. She might have gone for a couple of days and then come back. She wouldn't have disappeared for what, 26 years now. Also Misty is very easy to spot in a crowd. She was five foot nine. So she was very, very tall for a teenager blonde hair, green eyes, like her face was quite distinctive as well. Her face was everywhere, she was all over the media in the first few days when Diana was trying to get her face out there. So people probably would have seen her and nobody ever did. Despite what the police think, I don't think she was a runaway. I'm pretty sure she was abducted and murdered. And I hope one day that they find her bodies, but I'd love to know down below what you think happened to her. Who do you think is the main suspect here? Of course, it might not be any of these people. It might be somebody completely, completely random. I know this video has been super long, so I hope you guys have managed to stick it out until the end. If you have, thank you so much for watching. Um, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye guys.